This ESPN podcast is brought to you by GEICO. 15 minutes could save you 15% or more on car insurance. Visit GEICO.com. The BS Report is a free-flowing conversation that occasionally touches on mature subjects. The BS Report. The BS Report with Bill Simmons. Welcome to the BS Report, taping this on a Friday morning, West Coast time. I have a new giant uh, playoff column on Grantland.com as of probably like 3 p.m. on Friday. I spent way too much time working on it. I'm also on NBA Countdown Friday night, Saturday night, and Sunday uh, afternoon on ABC. So you're getting a lot of basketball talk from me, but that doesn't mean we can't have Joe House. Joe House, where are you? Where do you think you're going to spend the 2014 Wizards Championship Parade? Do you think you'll be on the route, or will you be watching on TV? How are you going to handle it? I'll be flat on my back. I, I have bullet fever. Hold on a second. Bullet fever happens to me every year. Bullet fever, and this year's the one. Oh, I got, <coughs> I'm, sorry, I'm stopping now. Is that a real song? That's a real song. Bullets fever? From 1970. Oh, I'm, I'm going to get yelled at by the real Bullet diehards, eight or nine, and it's Niels Lofgren. Oh, my it's, God. It's, it's the great Niels Lofgren. You know, I might have to belatedly work that into my column that hasn't gone up yet. <laughs> it's a, I can easily send you a link. I I, I posted the remix on uh, my Twitter earlier this week because I had That's... the bullet fever. Anyway, yeah, I'll be flat on my back if the wizard uh, almost bullets were to do something like that. What, so I wrote about this in my column, and, and I gave all my thoughts, which I'm happy to rehash here, but... Give us your thoughts. You're a lifelong Washington fan. Um, not a lot of happy moments over the last 35 years, and that's an understatement. This team has blown multiple top six lottery picks. They've made mistakes left and right. They've made weird trades. They've overpaid people. And yet the the overall mix is, is kind of likable. Oh, it's, it's extremely likable. It's exceedingly likable. It's every bit as uh, interesting as, and as exciting as the mid-2000 teams with Arenas and Hughes and Antoine Jameson and Karam Butler, which look like kind of the, the, the cornerstone that Hughes dropped out because they wouldn't pay him to the big – they wouldn't sign him up to a big contract, which I thought was a great move at the time. But uh, Karam Butler and Jameson and, 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 and uh, Gilbert – Look like it could be something. Gilbert hurt his knee. But, uh, yeah, this team, honestly, I think is better than, than those teams for the mid-2000s because it's an all-in team where um, the, the, through the combination of, you know, a little good luck with the draft, getting high draft picks, and a couple of those guys actually bearing some fruit. So we have, a, you know, what everybody is referring to as an exciting young, uh, dynamic backcourt that could be among the best in the league going forward, and then this great array of vets surrounding them, and everybody's gotten healthy at exactly the right time, and uh, the combination of uh, poise that guys like Nene and the professor Andre Miller and um, my my guy Drew Gooden um, offer. I forgot about uh, Drew Gooden. You know what's interesting? Yeah. You and I could have said, and actually, I, 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 I got to say, I, I did pick the Wizards to make the Eastern Finals. But you and I, I, I mentioned that only because I'm never right, ever. But you and I could have, in mid-April, right before the playoff, early April, right before the playoff started, you and I could have laid out on a podcast the best-case scenario for what would happen to the Wizards in the playoffs. And that best-case scenario would have included Nene deciding to be the Nene that uh, can talk people into giving him $13 million a year if you catch him on the right night. Um, yeah. Trevor Ariza playing for a new contract, playing out of his mind. Oh, Andre yeah. Miller coming off the bench and being kind of a nightmare matchup for people's backup guards, especially if they're undersized. Uh-huh. Bradley, Bradley Beal kind of emerging in game two is a little bit of a, 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 a real two guard creator, you know, like the, some of these like Joe Johnson type little mid range shots mixed with the threes. I like that. John Keep wall wasn't you. John wall wasn't playing that well, but, but didn't seem afraid in game two, which I liked. And then you have 
you know, Gortat and Webster and Drew Gooden, like this does feel like a playoff team. Am I overthinking this? No, no there's, you can't overthink it. You just described it. It really is a legit playoff team that we have been greatly helped by uh, playing the Bulls in the first round. It, it, this this collection of basketball players with the skills that they possess, this, this Washington group, um, is a, just an absolute nightmare matchup-wise for, for the Bulls. They are exactly what give the Bulls and their um, enormously talented uh, defense both in execution and scheme fits, which is big guys that can pass uh, and pass to each other, plus a point guard that can penetrate to the middle and make good decisions um, from the middle of the lane about either putting up a shot or kicking it to the corners. And, you know, we've seen it now twice. The Bulls can't score the basketball. That was the biggest reason why I thought Washington was going to win. Because, and, you know what? I wouldn't have even thought of it if I didn't accidentally stumble into game 82, the last five minutes of regulation, then OT against Charlotte, Bull Charlotte, when it just kind of dawned on me. And then maybe I should have realized it sooner, but it was just so hard for them to get a good shot. And I remember there was one moment, I think it was like Charlotte 85, Bulls 80 in the OT. And the Bulls were coming out of the timeout, right? So you figure, all right, well, they're going to get a really good shot here. And the and the play ended up being like kind of an ISO for Jimmy Butler, right? And I was just sitting there going, "Wait a second, this isn't going to work in the playoffs. Like the defenses <laughs> get better in the playoffs. <laughs> you can't do yeah. this." Now, as we say this, we're we're counting out Tom Thibodeau, we're counting out Joe Kim Noah, who got counted out twice in round one last year, and then ended up beating the Nets by himself. Um, does a party... I'm not counting out anybody, by the way. I'm okay, not... I was going to ask. So this is he... still my. This is still the almost bullets. Believe me. Okay, good. Because I because I'm aware of how quickly the script can get flipped. Yeah, in my column today, I sent you a whole bunch of things. I was including. I tried to describe the Wizards' history in a hundred words, <laughs> and left out a couple things. And then you read <laughs> some of the stuff I left out. But you know, not a not a franchise that. Um. End up in a not a franchise that ends up in a lot of conversations with basketball fans. Um, there were no, there's no like Bowie over Jordan type tipping point moment that you could remember, but there were a lot of smaller ones, right? Like the C Web trading C Web right before his career took off. Yeah. Uh, trading Rip Hamilton right before his career took off. Drafting yep. Kwame Brown over Pau Gasol. Trading sure. the Rubio Curry pick for Mike Miller and Randy Foy. Yeah, uh, all the top twelve and top six picks you wasted, giving Andre Blatch an extension, um, and then realizing you needed to amnesty him before the extension kicked in. Uh, you took <laughs> Kenny Green one pick ahead of Carl Malone. That happened. You, you employed George Mirasan and Manute Bowl. That happened. You had Wes Unseld and Ernie Grunfeld running your team. I just think, look, the franchise, um, since winning the championship in, in the in the late 70s, really took to heart the entertainment component of, of the product. They really went for, for entertainment over over quality Common basketball sense. or sustainable yeah. franchise stability or good decision-making. You can't say it hasn't been entertaining. Wow. Really? You, you, I guess, like, I don't know if entertaining is the word I would use. No. <laughs> Maybe depressing, uh, absorbing, underwhelming. No, it's 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 definitely been interesting. <laughs> Would you say whatever a more interesting word than interesting is? Uh, yeah, compelling? compelling. Yeah, yeah, compelling. Maybe. But compelling like, in in the way of of like you know car crashes and and train wrecks. Yeah, I was going to say, I saw, or driving home from work about two weeks ago, I saw a, a car crash on, in Koreatown. And uh, that was also compelling. Um, but, yeah, it's certainly been compelling. And one of the weird things about the Wiz is, is that just a penchant for catching people at the wrong points of their careers over and over again, right? Like you had Bernard and Moses – Right about five years after you would have wanted either of them. You had C-Web we, three to four years before you would have wanted C-Web. You know what I mean? It's like you never yeah. caught somebody in the sweet spot. Mitch Richmond, same thing. No. I mean, we got Juwan Howard's sweet spot. 
<laughs> for whatever that, whatever that's worth. You got a hundred million eight. dollars of it. Got that one. Yeah. <laughs> no, I, look, we could do this for for you know t- two hours, but the it, it's what makes this moment right now um, so incredible that all of the components have come together in in one instance where you know it really only takes one or two things to derail the potential success, and you know it looks like we may actually have a shot at making it to the second round of the playoffs, which would just be feel like an incredible achievement over the past after the past um, 10 years. And, and uh, you know, I, I have my fingers crossed. I, like I said a little earlier, not counting on anything, but, uh, you know, fingers crossed. I like the direction that everything is headed in. Well, you know how selfish I am as an only child. <laughs> I, 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 I always put myself first. Times. I put myself first over the expense of basically anyone else except for my two kids. And even then, sometimes it's a struggle. Um, we're traveling for the Eastern Finals for the countdown show, and then we're traveling for yeah. the finals. I'm very focused on a Miami Washington finals right now. Games three and four of that of that Eastern Finals would be Memorial Day weekend. Wow. Which means um I get to spend Memorial Day weekend in Washington, DC. One of my favorite cities. A place that's brought me immense amount of joys. Uh immense amount of joy over the past twenty five years. Um basically for the entire time we've been friends. Can't used to come to visit you. Um the one promise I can make you, we will eat well. We will eat well. Um, had had a couple of great book signings there where we ran oh, out of books true. both times. I love the people yeah, watching. Yeah, loves Simmons. Yeah, they 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 showed up for the book signings. That's for sure. It's a great city, and it's and it's also a city that uh, you always feel like you're in a movie. You take it for granted because you live there. Um, I just love being there. So and, yeah. and it, it it wouldn't be too hot at that point, right? Mid late May or would it? Well, that that's a crapshoot. It's impossible yeah. to say. Well, I'm rooting for that. My my dream Final Four would be Miami and Washington. And then, you know, Clippers versus Portland is in play. It's in play. What are you talking about? Yeah. It's in play. And, Holy and cow, is it in I play. love both of those cities because I yeah, live in Portland's one of them and I love Portland. Yeah. And then, you know, Memphis is in play. I love Memphis. Memphis I, is cool. I, I, I mean, I, I like uh, everything that you sent me last year. Last year was your first time really spending time there, right? Yeah, I loved it. Jalen, I loved yeah, it. Yeah, I was so impressed by that. Yeah, I mean, it's not going to be great for my physical conditioning and my weight, uh, but neither will San Antonio. Yeah, there was food and culture. You were giving me a bunch of, uh, you know, oh, I found this place for food and I found this place. Yeah, for music, and I found this place. So I was, yeah. I was, it was impressive. Yeah, we weren't there quite long enough either. So I would, I would love to uh, go back and spend a little more time. I got to say, like, I'm not against San Antonio, but we were there for eight days last last summer, and uh, and I, I feel like that. I feel like eight days was enough. I feel yeah. like I'm, I'm good. You got it. I'm all. Good. I'm happy to go back. I love the atmosphere at the games, but uh, it would be fun to spend all that time in Portland. Anyway, I'm babbling. But it, it's what, just what's crazy to me is how many possible scenarios are in play for the finals. Like usually, midway through round one, there's four matchups, and you know it's going to be one of the four matchups. This time around, we know Miami's going to probably almost definitely be in there, but we have no idea who they're playing in the Eastern Finals. Yeah. And then the West, I you could talk me into five teams in the West. Is yeah. It really five? I don't think five. Oklahoma City, Memphis, okay. yeah. San Antonio, the Clippers, oh. and Portland. Okay. That's five. Okay, okay, okay. I was leaving out. Uh, well, let's go San back Antonio. to that because I want to hit the Wiz one more thing on the Wiz. Um, to try to describe uh, the atmosphere in D.C. because it is a basketball city. So I, on a scale I one to, to ten, you, how fired up are people? I don't have an answer. It's a it's a sensational question. I'm going to find out tonight because uh, you know this this. This level of success that this team is showing right now, um, you only saw the briefest of, of glimpses of it during the season. So it isn't like the team came together in late October, early November, and immediately caught the city's fancy and reeled off like a six- or seven-game winning streak. And everybody's like, holy cow, what's going on here? This team's legit. Instead, it was like modest success. 
uh, coupled with guys going down um, and new players coming in. So Gortat came in right at the beginning of the season. So who is he? What is he's an unknown quantity? We know it's a contract here. What are we going to see out of him? And um, Andre Miller came in, you know, mid-year. Um, you know, is he going to make a valuable contribution? And Bradley Beal was on a limited minute, put on a minutes restriction after the coach of the Washington team um, kind of ran him into the ground yeah. a little bit at the beginning of the season. So you never really, there wasn't an identity at the beginning of the season that caught your fans. You say, oh yeah, the whole city, let's, let's go. You know, this is, this is, we've been waiting for this for 10 years, but now the buzz, what I'm, what I'm seeing and hearing among like the, the, Washington basketball Illuminati. It's it's like kind of fever pitch. I'm really excited about tonight. I'm going to the game. I think it's going to be pretty hot. It's. Do you think Barry's in the house tonight? No, definitely not. Game four. Game four. Yeah. Well, you know what? If actually, that's a great question. If if uh, because if it looks like it's going to be a sweep, why would he come to game four? So maybe tonight is the night. I hope and, not. And there's it, an it, Obama. It takes two hours to get into the stadium when, whenever he comes. Yeah, they could, they could at least give you the heads up. That'd be nice. I love that. I love that you just complained about going to games that also have the president of the United States at them. <laughs> <laughs> it's a huge pain in the ass. I've been to three of them. It takes forever. <laughs> Stay away, Barry. Maybe. Uh, Why do I? Maybe maybe Michelle will go. She's trying to get out there more. So anyway, uh, so Obama, we might see Obama in the house. We might not. Can I ask you kind of the elephant in the room? There's two elephants in the room here. Go ahead. Um, One, the better the Wiz do, the more likely it is that Randy Whitman and Ernie Grenfell will probably be given seven-year extensions by Ted Leonsis. Like, you're prepared for that, right? I'm not prepared for that, and I won't accept it. I don't think that, that, you know, one year of uh, modest success after a rebuild effort that's had so many fits and, and, and starts to it, uh, earns anybody, you know, enormous job security. This is, you know, it's it's still uh, what have you done for me lately? And I need to to see, you know, a little bit of, of sustained performance out of those two before I'm ready to accept the idea that that it, uh, any kind of uh, multi-year extension is warranted under these circumstances. Okay, good answer. Uh, next elephant in the room. I, I guess there's actually three. Next elephant in the room. Um, you realize if you make the Eastern Finals, they're going to assign Gortat to like a five-year, $58 million extension, and then they're also going to give Andre Miller like a three-year, $15 million deal that will end when he's like 45 years old. Like you're okay with that too, right? I feel like you're, pu- you're punching me in the stomach right well, now. Well, I'm just telling you these are things that's going to happen. I just want you to think well, about start thinking the, about them now. The, the Gort- I honestly would be fine with the Nene thing because I really do give Nene credit for um, re- directing the franchise, his arrival really did herald a new level of professionalism. He really, more than anybody, he's the one that John Wall should be, you know, thanking on kind of a, a daily basis for bringing um, a, a combination of, of poise and professionalism, basketball intellect to the organization. You know, I, I uh, made a little contribution at some point this season about uh, – Nene and his contract and whether he's earned it. I think it's it's again the case that like he's the only Washington basketball player of like the last I don't know how many years that you would say and in the games that he played the the team has won more games than than lost. Mm-hmm. I think they're back up out, up over five hundred. The fact that you can't say that about very many Washington players over the last ten years, you know, it tells you something. Over but, the last uh, ten, so I, I, I think giving him a contract to reward him is fine, huh? What about the last thirty five years? You said the last ten. Well, I, I looked it up. Look, you we, haven't, the Wizards haven't retired a number since Elvin Hayes and Wes Unseld. <laughs> like, think about that for a second. You were watching those. You were watching Elvin Hayes and Wes Unseld before you had armpit hair. That, that's a fact. That's a long um, drought. I don't. That, I don't have. <laughs> I mean, you know, I, what do you, I don't want to have an answer to it. All right. Well, can we get to the third elephant in the room? Go ahead. Just Randy Whitman in general. I know he's been okay this round, but at he's, some point, at some he's point, got the highest winning percentage of any coach in NBA history right 
playoff history. He's got he's got the lowest winning percentage of anyone who's coached 500 games or anyone with 500 <laughs> losses, and he's got the highest playoff winning percentage ever. It's quite a, quite a career for Randy. <laughs> what a combo! Did uh, when they were melting down practically with uh, the six point lead with 40 seconds left that they almost blew until Kirk Heinrich missed the uh, the first free throw there. Yeah. Um, were you ready to fight Randy Whitman? No, no, no. Okay. He, he's beaten me into submission. I've oh. watched him lose those games all season long. Randy's done it to me a dozen times now. I was so prepared for them to lose <laughs> Tuesday night. I was so prepared to go to bed mad. Uh, it was, you know, I ended up having sweet, sweet dreams of, of missed uh, Heinrich jumpers and, and DJ Augustine misses and, and Dunleavy misses that replaced the nightmare that I've already been through so many times with, you know, seizing defeat from the jaws of victory. <laughs> That's been the MO. That's part of why the, the buzz thing that you asked me about earlier, it's like this team invents ways to lose. I'm not ready to start, you know, singing hosannas. Let's, let's, let's win a series. Let's, let's start doing something that, that, uh, that matters when, when it matters, um, before we, we get too excited. You know, uh, Everyone loves Tom Thibodeau, Tom Thibodeau, Tom Thibodeau, including myself. Uh, he played, he played Jimmy Butler 53 of 53 minutes the other night. What's his alternative? I, I mean, he's been doing it for three months. I, I think he yeah. wore this Bulls team down a little bit. It's almost like they traded Dang and he's like, Oh, really? You're going to, you're going to cripple my team? Well, watch this. I'm going to do everything I can possibly do to get us in the playoffs. I don't care who I wear down. I don't care what happens. Um, but to play somebody 50, to play a perimeter player who's guarding the toughest guy on the other yeah. team at all times, 53 out of 53 minutes seems like a suicide mission to me. Um, maybe so. I, I don't begrudge him, uh, any of the decision making or judgment that he uses. In, in uh, going I'm about gonna begrudge him on that. He's kind of I'm, earned the benefit of the doubt, I would say. No, nah, I'm going to begrudge him on that. I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go with the history him. of you the NBA. Him. I'm going to go with the history of the NBA, which says you shouldn't play somebody every minute of a playoff game. Uh, Somebody I would, not I would, named LeBron? I would have played that Tony Snell a little bit. I like Tony Snell. He's got that kind yeah. of scary Marquise Daniels look to him that I like. He's, he's a little unpredictable. <laughs> see, I can see that. I don't have any argument. Him. I don't think it would have changed the outcomes, but... Hey, on a scale of one to ten, if Jimmer came into a game, into game three with the Bulls down eight, would you be frightened? Scale oh one to ten. Oh my God, I would, uh, I would be elated. I would, would be, be elated. It would be such wow. a sign of desperation. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Put, elated. Yeah, please put more D leaguers in. Please, please put more D leaguers in the game. Come on, I'm like the last guy in Jimmer's corner. You're the uh, only. It's you I, and the Fredette family. Would you be scared if they played Boozer? Noah and Gibson at the same time? Yes, I would. That lineup frightens the S out of me. That's the lineup I like the least. Taj Gibson, to me, is the 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 most frightening bull because yeah. he can get to the basket. He can get to the free throw line. And it's really, I, I, I'm not sure why we haven't seen that lineup. <laughs> I, I have a sneaky suspicion we're going to see it some tonight. Hmm. Uh, all right. Good luck. Thank you. I, I, I know the uh, I know the bullets wizard bullet slash wizard wizard bullet slash wizards history isn't great, but uh, this is this is fun. This there's, feels right. Something about this feels always, right. Plus, yeah, there's always time to reinvent yourself. Plus, if you win, you get the winner of Indiana Atlanta in the next round. I mean, can can you think of a bigger gift? Unbelievable. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I don't, I'm not, you know, gift, no gift, whatever. It's it's the playoffs, and you you line up against the teams that you uh, are paired with, and you do the very best you can, and, and and that's it. I mean, some years you get guy teams that that have players that get hurt, and some years you're the team with your best players hurt. I mean, Washington for two consecutive what years. What are you made talking the about? You sound like you're giving an interview. What are you talking about? <laughs> You don't believe that. I'm you not, want to play the, you, you're dying to play the Pacers of the Heat. Who are you kidding? <laughs> the, the, the Hawks suck. You're true. It's so true. Both, both of the, God, I would love to play both those teams. The Hawks suck, and the Pacers are having an emotional breakdown, the likes of which we've never seen in a basketball yeah, they, season I mean, before. They're, we're kind of, they're like past having. They've already had it. They've had an emotional breakdown. 
now they're in that super fragile state of like, is it going to be, is it going to take them six months to recover? Or is it just going to be a two year tailspin? I got to say, I, I think they're, I, I really think they might be the first team we mentioned anytime this ever happens in the future. I think they're going to be the go-to example. Like if it, if somebody's doing there? really well and starts melting down and goes on some losing streak and loses momentum and some weird stuff starts happening, we'll just instantly be like, "Uh oh, is this a 2014 Pacers type situation?" Well, I think they're so the go-to example. I can't come up with a historical antecedent. You know who who is who is it, what predecessor out there can you point to and say here is the, the the team that they're the most like? So. <laughs> the two, the Isaiah Pacers in 2003, I think they had the best record of the All-Star break. They weren't as good as this Pacers team, though, and they, they melted That's... down and ended up losing in round one. Right. Um, but they, you know, the Pacers were 33-7. and seven. That's that's a 67-win pace. Right. You know? It's not like they were, it's not just that they were, were playing well. They were, they were winning almost 80% of their games. And to have it flip like that, I mean... You, you might go back to – it's not even that, a What good, about that Pistons team that put four guys on the all-star team? Yeah, but even that team, like, made the conference finals. Yeah. You know? Like, yeah. I mean, you could say, you could go back and you could say the 95 magic from the moment Nick Anderson missed those four free throws. They were never the same. But even that, like, I think they won, like, 59 games the next year, you know? You could say the the ninety two Blazers after Jordan destroyed them in the finals. I don't need. I'm, they might not have made the playoffs the next year, which was weird because everybody was thinking. Let me look that up. That everybody was thinking that that was like you know. Remember they made the ninety finals. They made the ninety two yeah. finals. Everyone was thinking yeah. that that was a. Oh yeah, no, they won fifty one games the next year. Yeah, there's really there's not there's never really been anything like this. Um, they can't win. They 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 can't lose in this first round. It just feels like it'll be catastrophic. Let me look up the uh, the the Sonics won the title in '79. Remember the Sonics? R.I.P. <sighs> yeah, they won. They won 56 games the next year, and they lost in the Western Finals. And then they went 34 and 48 the next year. But hey, just to have it happen in one season, I I can't. You know me. I I I love this stuff, and I can't come up with a good example. That, that's what I thought. I thought it was it's going to be tough to come up with an example. Well, I I I wrote about this a little in my column. I don't mean to keep bringing up the column, but it's tough to they. You know, some of the stuff's going to overlap. Um, are we sure the Pacers were that good to begin with? 33 and seven is pretty good. Okay, but here's my counter. So they beat the Hawks in that crappy liver die by the three Knicks team in round two last year. Then they get Miami in round three. Miami's on cruise control. That weight's hurt. You know what? It, it just they, you knew you always knew Miami was better. It was just a question of whether they were going to try in the game or not. They blow them out in game seven. They come into this season. They're playing. They're in the terrible East. They start out like 18 and 2 against a cream puff schedule. They're up to 33 and 7. Schedule gets harder. They hit a little adversity and they totally completely cave. Is that enough of a track record to say somebody's like a great team? Did anybody say nobody said that they were a great team? Right. But that's my they, point. Like maybe they maybe they weren't even that good of a team. No, I, I, they're they're good. It's definitely it, it, there's a there's some kind of uh, they're diseased. They have some kind of ailment. There's some kind of dysfunction going on there that that has to be more sort of confidence and mental than than physical. They they were the number one defense all season long for, for a reason. Like what changed? Why, why did Roy Hibbert start off being you know a contender for all all defensive player of the year, defensive player of the year? And turn into you know a, a shell of that. What happened with him? Um, we we were watching the games on Sunday. Me and Jalen and Collins and Sage and everybody, and we we actually started having an argument about whether Ray Hibbert had trade value anymore. And 
somebody in the room, I won't say who, was pointing out that if you just didn't know anything and you had no background of any knowledge and you were just watching the games right now, you would think Roy Hibbert was on his way out of the league. Like I mean, just it's from tough to argue the way, with. He's the way being he's outplayed. And it's not even just outplayed, like the way he's moving, how slow he is, how bad his hands are, um, how how out of shape he seems all of a sudden, how dispirited he seems. Right. Um, like I was joking about him turning in Hashim the beat on the on our last regular season show we did. But really, like I don't think there's any difference between the Hibbert we're seeing at this moment right now and Hashim the beat. They're basically the same guy. It, it's not like Hashim Thabit would be doing worse. Well, you know? it, it says all anybody needs to, to know or, or, or understand about the situation is that that comparison, you can't dismiss it out of hand. No. That tells you the whole story. Well, but in, in the history of the NBA says that these big guys, they do just lose it. And you don't know when it's going to happen. But when they lose it, it's gone. If you, you're past a certain height and you're kind of lumbering anyway, and, and you can pass this invisible line and then it's over. And yeah, I he's think a really pretty young though, right? I know that's the weird thing. He's only 27. See, this is why I would trade for him. He's got two years left for, for like too. 30 million. I, I would totally trade for him. I just think, um, I think that he got worn down by the minutes. I think it's a really bad situation. There's a lot of crazy stuff going on with that team. That I mean, I don't even think the outside world even knows about. I don't know about. You don't know about. Um, yeah. Clearly, I somebody, like, there's an insider that's, that's keeping notes so we can see the book. I, I bet the stories are fascinating. Well, this is why the advanced metrics movement, all the stats, like all that stuff's great. It's one thing that helps you watch the game. But ultimately, the eye test is, is still a huge, a huge help to watching games. And you watch this yeah. Indiana team, and they hate each other. Yeah. Like, just watch the games. They don't even interact with one another anymore. I mean, it's like they're they're like barely tolerating one another, and it, it's right. bizarre. There's no galvanizing yeah. guy slap running around slapping people on the asses. George Hill looks miserable. He's playing terrible. Cabert looks miserable. Paul George looks like he just wants to get out of there. Lance is like doing his own thing. Like that team is a mess. Well, but you know, there was the thing that that is confusing is. That game two performance was pretty good, and, and you know the moment that 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 everybody went crazy when they made the uh, three pointer right before the end of the, I mean at the end of the third quarter going into the fourth. Yeah, it was like you know they they won the championship moment, and it looked like maybe that was the release that they needed. Uh, and I thought, oh wow, this is interesting. Maybe and then they just ran, you know, took took care of business in the fourth quarter. And I thought, oh maybe this is going to be a four one series. Maybe that was the switch. But then they came out, and the Hawks just took it right to them last night, right to them. And I've seen, I've seen the Hawks do that so many times, especially at home, where you're just watching and thinking, like, how are they winning this game? And they just, they just keep winning it, and then they win it. And you, and and then you they watch, it. and you go, I don't understand. I see all the guys they have in the court. They, they, there's Jeff Teague, there's Perry Antich, there's Kyle Korver, there's Demar Carroll. Like I. There's nobody. There's nobody else that's hurt, and or, I, it's just bizarre. It's the Hawks thing is bizarre. They're really well coached. I kind of regret yeah. not putting Coach Buds in my top three for Coach of the Year. I like him. He's working Vogel like a speed bag. Poor Vogel. Oh. Yeah. Well, I mean, right. He's he's got a very dead man walking feel to him. And there's no way Lance comes back. I. I think they make him the fall guy if, if they lose this round. I agree with you. Because he is in full-fledged I got this mode. You don't want Lance, you don't want Lance to be your I got this guy. You you uh, have been writing it for three months now. Yeah. Uh, Oklahoma City, Memphis, the most fascinating of the eight series. Oh, you find it even more fascinating than Houston, Portland. Yeah, I do. Because Houston, Portland is just it's coaching malpractice and Houston's not making shots. <laughs> and Aldridge just got hot, got really crazy hot for two games. And, and yeah, I, I mean, I, I will just to finish Houston, Portland. I don't know what uh, Houston can do to beat Portland. It looks like Houston can't beat Portland. The only way they could do it is every all those shots they shoot sixty percent. I all actually did, go I, in. I disagree with you. I'm going to respectfully disagree. 
Great. They should, did you watch game one? I Every second of it. They won the game. They just freaking gave it away. I mean, that was a, a giveaway. They were up 10. They started doing hack a Howard and some goofy stuff, and then they, there was some defensive lapses, and they took a couple of bad shots, and all of a sudden they lost the game. But that they should have won that game. Uh, okay, I know we could say that about a lot of they, games, but they, they really – I know, but I'm saying, like, it's not like they came in and spanked them for two. They you spanked them in the second game. Things that are, right? No, I agree with you. Those are those are all though fortitude um, elements. What you just sort of listed off. A team up ten needs to win that game. That's it. It's the playoffs. You just win the game when you're up ten like that. It's the I know, reason but the, that it, the the biggest I, problem with that team is also the reason why I don't think they can be counted out because they can come out tonight in game three and make. 18 to 29 threes and win by 15. That's true. I totally agree with that. That's why I just I said can't count if Houston they shoot out. 60%, they're going to win. They, they're that's, an up and down team. That's the only thing that could make, make that different. Anyway, but OKC and, and Memphis. I'm, I'm, I'll, well, I'll well, hold on. Let's finish here. Houston Portland now. So you. Okay. The, has your ceiling for Portland changed at all? No, I just think they are an excruciating matchup for Houston. They They, they just. Houston <laughs> doesn't have anybody, including Dwight Howard, that can um, guard uh, Aldridge. That's bizarre, That's Aldridge. by the way. You would have thought Ashik would be able to guard Lamarcus Aldridge. Well, is that 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 one's interesting? Is that uh, uh, a question of ability or will? Because you know Ashik's been pretty public about his um, distaste for the Houston situation and. Yeah. Uh, it continues to be the case that he's in every single trade rumor involving Houston, including deals that clear room for them to, to be able to acquire Carmelo. So I think Ashik kind of doesn't give Ashik a little bit. <laughs> That's my theory. That's a fair point. It yeah. does seem like a kind of a rudderless team emotionally. Yeah. Great, I love Kevin McHale. Great, great, it's great. I, it's really hard for me to say anything bad about Kevin McHale, but um, it would be interesting to see what happened if that team had a real coach. The thing that that continues to be like concerning is James Harden in the postseason. Uh, uh oh. I'm not going to be concerned unless he sucks tonight. Okay. I I just think he's the streakiest superstar we have. We've watched it all year. He he can look terrible in some games, and then he can look awesome in other games. He's up and down. All right. I, but if he him. sucks tonight, then then I think it's a thing. You suck three yeah, yeah. times in a row. That's tonight, a thing. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He can have two crap games. I mean, he he takes terrible shots, but he takes he's took terrible shots all year. That's what they that's what they are. That's the system that's, they've created. The I love Darrow, but he's created a world in which layups and threes are the only thing that matters. So when when this team needs a real basket, they fall into the they either put their head down and go to the basket, or they shoot a three. And, and Dwight Howard can't get touches. And that's who they are. Yeah, and you give the ball to Dwight Howard and, and you know, then then you're worried he's gonna get fouled the whole time. Yeah. Um I do like you know, I know people made a big fuss about it, but it is fun that Aldridge kind of brought back the twenty footer. Which oh, we've been yeah. hearing is totally irrelevant for the last couple of years. But the reality is in playoff games, it seems to be the shot that's available. And it's nice to have somebody who can make fifty percent of them. You know who um Who's making those twenty footers? Nay, 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 nay. nay, nay. That's right. Um, all right, Oklahoma City, Memphis. Is there a universe in which OKC loses this game and Russell Westbrook is not on OKC next year, or, the, or loses no. the series? No, no, no. So they fire. No. They'd fire Scott Brooks before they blew up the team with the trade. Oh my gosh, yes, a okay. thousand times yes, a million times yes. He's just too good. Russell Westbrook. Would you fire Scott Brooks before game four? No, but I did wonder if Frank Vogel would get fired before game four. I wondered <laughs> if Larry Bird might show up on the sidelines for one of these games. I'm not kidding. That that would probably be one of the five greatest moments of my life. <laughs> he could do it. I mean, they, they need to flip the script. Why couldn't that happen? It would be amazing. Uh, anyway. Do, do you yeah, think Memphis no, so is Scotty better Brooks than is not Oklahoma City? Get fired. Yeah, yes, this is the thing, right? Me- Memphis is a legit like sixty win team. They're a yeah. high fifties, almost sixty win team. It just that Gasol got 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 hurt. You know, yeah. Mark Gasol got hurt for a little while. That's all. 
Yeah. Put them in the East. They're, and... they're legit. They're legit, legit. The only thing I continue to regret about Memphis, because I love their style of basketball, it just feels like, you know, watching Bad Boys, watching the, the terrific 30 for 30, you guys did an awesome job. I know Thanks. that uh, they're a throwback team, this Memphis team. They make me feel like that Bad Boys team a little bit, the, the, the grit and grime, right? Yeah, and, and you know what? It's, this is a Doug Collins phrase. I love the coach. He's, he calls it sweat equity. Oh. And it's about when a team has won and lost together for a long enough time, they have sweat equity, and they know who they are. They know what their identity is. And I like that a lot. They're bonded, I, by, the, bonded by the sweat. Yeah, it's one, of his, it's one of his better one phrases. Outside shooter. That's the only thing I really wish they had. They have. But the thing is, they're in such a better spot with that than they were last year. Because Courtney Lee's pretty good. You know, he, he's, he's confident at least, unlike the guys they had last year. And, and Miller will have two games a series where he's making them, you know? Yeah. I mean, Miller, and, Miller really is that X factor. The other thing is the way Tony's playing, uh, you know, and he, he'll never be able to shoot, but at least this year, because he's a hundred percent healthy again, he's like doing those back baseline cuts and flying to the rim and getting offensive he's getting to rebounds. The basket. That's the biggest thing. Yeah. He's, he's, I'm he's making, making free, I'm look up. Has he missed a free throw? I don't He's making think stuff that. happen. And, He's uh, making his free throws this year. And that, and they're also very, 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 very tough to beat at home when they're when they're playing well. That's what made I, I, that's what made uh, Game Three incredible was was just that the Thunder ripped off what was it seventeen to zero. Yep. I I just think like the, if if Durant and Westbrook get bounced in round one. And you look at the three-year arc of this, where they they win one finals game in 2012. Westbrook gets hurt last year; they're not heard from. And this year, bounced in round one in an upset. And you're talking about the second best player in the league, and like the eighth, ninth, tenth, whatever you want to put Westbrook player in the league. And then Ibaka, who's probably the best third guy in the league, and and that's your three-year output. Like that's a shame. So it, I, it, it, you, I, fine. I, I'll agree with that. It, it is a shame, um, but you just run them back out there. They're still super young. They're still, you know, the the team has room to try and and, and put some parts together. Stephen Adams was a little bit of a, a revelation. He'll be a year older and better and have all that experience under his belt next year. They will have replaced the disaster that is Jeremy Lamb. You would expect. Um, Derek Fisher may finally hang it up and, and, you know, so there, there's some room for them to do stuff on the edges that could end up having an effect on the whole. You know what killed them? And I, I don't know if there was a way to foresee this or not, but paying, continuing to pay Kendrick Perkins $9 million a year. Well, not, not in the stadium really hurt, but not to bring up the hard trade. I know it's a sore subject. <laughs> All my thoughts are already explained. But I think the one thing they didn't realize was that the cap was going to jump. When they traded uh-huh. Harden, they lived in a world where it would have been inconceivable to keep four double-figure superstars on the same team. But then that world changed. And you had, you know, they could have, they absolutely could have afforded Harden the first year they traded him, no question. They also could have afforded him this year if they amnestied Perkins. They, they, they still would have been stayed under the tax. So there's two years they would have been able to afford him. This upcoming year, they also would have been able to afford him if they amnestied Perkins because the cap is jumping up by like five and a half million. So I think it's like it's at uh, 67. I don't remember the number, but we do live in a world now where you could you could uh, you could pay four double figure guys. And the other thing, they got a nice relative discount on on uh, Durant and Westbrook for probably where those numbers are going down the road. For sure. Uh, they got Matt. Those guys are at quote unquote max prices, but they're max prices from three years ago. Right. So had they, had they just given Harden the four years, 58 and added that to the other ones, I, I they could have afforded it with the way the cap operates. So, you know, you can't totally blame them for not seeing that we'd have this uh, revenue boom, but man. Yeah. The one, um, the one, uh, franchise that I <clears throat> will uh, never forgive on along these lines is Dallas for what Cuban did uh, by immediately disassembling 
a championship team and never giving him an opportunity to defend their title because he had a point of view on which way the labor situation and the, the salary cap and the collective bargaining agreement was going to operate. Do you think that's a Ray Hibbert destination? Wow. Yeah. Holy wow. Mm. I, um, I'll just say yes. Yeah, I think so too. I mean, if there's a franchise <laughs> that has shown an the ability to overpay appetite, centers, yeah. it's like the way that I look at, at a, at a, at a um, two racks of ribs, you know, in front of me. A little baby back beef ribs, but then a great big pack of uh, yeah, pork ribs. That's the way Dallas looks at big, big centers. That's funny. Uh, you don't think the Spurs are in any semblance of trouble, right? No, no, they're not in trouble. Okay. Absolutely Would not. You- I wrote this in today's column. Remember that game in the 2012 playoffs? The Heat were down 2-1 to one to Indiana. It yes. was the first wave of, uh-oh, Miami, this could really, they could, this could be it. And Wade and LeBron came out, and they put up like 70 points, 27 rebounds, and 18 assists. Like they just had yes. one of the most incredible combo games in the history of basketball. Yep. And they basically just laid the smack down on everybody and did the whole, look, just stop. We're, we, right. we're still the best. Do you think Durant and Westbrook are at that point with Game Four in Memphis, the Memphis Oklahoma City series? Huh? Is That's that a curious. fork in the road game for them, the same way that Game Four of that Indiana series was for Miami? Oh, it's it's definitely a fork in the road game. I just I don't know if it's enough. They may do that. They may rattle rip that kind of game off those two, but I, still, I still think that Memphis can win. <laughs> It's hard for me to believe that the team with the best player in the series isn't going to win the series. Like, a lot has to go wrong. I mean, Durant is the best player in the series, and Westbrook might even be the second best player in the series. It, it, it has to be an, an overall collapse to not it, win well, the series I don't, I don't when think you have that's the two true. It's a fascinating – you have two competing narratives there, right? You have well, – let's use the coaches. You have a team with probably – Second only to the Spurs in terms of sweat equity, going up against two sort of transcendent talents. Oh, I'm with you. But, I, it, it, this is basketball in a nutshell. It's just yeah. I'm just pointing out that it doesn't really happen very often. You know, we saw it happen in the 04 finals with the Pistons and the Lakers. It's happened a few times over the course of, of NBA history, but it's just it's rare to see a team that has the two best players in the series, both of whom are top 10 guys who are both healthy. And they lose the series, and they just get beaten. It's a, you can't even say like Oklahoma City beat themselves. Like I, I you know, th- they miss shots in Game Three, but you miss shots in games. Like that's the playoffs. Yeah, no, the the the, the team that has you know two four point plays that that you know lost in overtime two two different games that that's not that's not a team that that beat itself. Yeah, they're legit. This is legit a legitimate. They should be down two to one. I. Absolutely. Every single day of the week. Do you um have the Clippers shown you anything that makes you think uh they're a little more championshipy than you thought they might be? Yeah, I, I actually love them. If if uh we didn't get a chance to do it, but if we'd sat down and gone through the brackets, I would put the Clippers in the finals against Miami this year. The Clippers are my are my West Coast team. Now that the the X factor with their success to me is Blake and I, you know, uh, he had a crappy game one and they lost, and he's had two dominant performances. Like, you know, he is m- making the leap kind of performances. And yeah, he's been if, doing if it he's all year. able to sustain that. Not, no, I know. I, I understand. He, he really did it. He, it started like a, around Christmas time because he, he didn't start off the year that way, did he? Yeah. That's no, I'm not arguing. Really I'm just saying, like, 30 point games. He's, anyway, he's game in, game out has been playing at that level every day for four months. Yeah, four months. Totally agree. And so I, I, I just love the Clippers. I love the composition of big and small. I love having Chris Paul uh, have the ball in his hands at the end of the game. I mean, I just everything about the composition of that team seems like a, like a finals kind of team to me. And I think they have an answer to, you know, the, the, the tough inside of three-minute baskets. I think they have like two or three answers, two or three different ways they can go. That makes yeah. them just a notch. That uh, takes them just a, a smidge ahead of San Antonio and Memphis in that in that regard. And with all of that said, yeah. Memphis is a nightmare matchup for them. 
<laughs> well, they, 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 it's been the, ma- the nightmare matchup. They, they play each other every year, and it's a dogfight. And they just, Memphis has gotten the better of them. Yeah, but, you know, the, the one of those years, they like Reggie Evans was playing big, big minutes for them. For they, the always had the, they always had the third big to throw out there. And this year it's... I don't think they can play big, big baby anymore. He was, he was just awful defensively in game one. And, uh, you know, they're going to have to make a go of it with Blake and DeAndre and this Matt Barnes, Turkaloo, just kind of keep your fingers crossed when Blake and DeAndre are in the game. That if uh, Memphis just has to be fired up for that matchup, plus they can throw Tony Allen on Chris. It's a nice matchup it, for them. I think it's going to be fascinating. I, I, I feel like the Clippers this year are poised to have the, the, the answers where in the past they didn't feel like they had, they had enough answers. What a great playoffs. I love basketball, so I never know if I'm the right authority on this, like whether something's a really great round one or not. But I really feel like this has been one of the best ones we've had. It feels like the payoff to what felt like a slightly underwhelming regular season Early in the season, you and I did a podcast where you were saying that it felt like a pretty lackluster regular season, and Barkley was talking about how the season sucked and, you know, the East being down and everything. It feels like everybody hanging in there and slogging through the regular season that, again, just feels like 10 games too many. I mean, just feels like they pay. Couldn't we just play 68 or 70 games? But anyway, this is the payoff. I'd be happy with 76, I think, is the right number. Just get rid of 76. 76 is your number? (laughs) <laughs> the sport, but, though, the sport, though, that really is the ultimate case of that is hockey. Oh my god! I mean, I went to twenty Kings regular season games this year. You know, and it's like the grind of, of the regular season is, you know, it is, became my thing with me and my daughter, and it's like really looking forward to the playoffs. You know, it's like, oh, this is great. I get, you know, this huge chunk of time with my daughter, and it's our thing, and we're gonna go, and hopefully the Kings will make the conference finals. We can hit some games. And they freaking, they're down, they fell behind 3 nothing in the series. The Sharks team was out of its mind. Yeah. And uh, they won last night to at least stave off the sweep. But, you know, to sit through seven months of regular, this year was seven months because the Olympics pushed everything back. Yeah. Sit through seven months of these games where, you know, so many times you can kind of tell when the hockey guys are kind of mailing it in a little bit. Oh, and yeah. Then, yeah, you can. And the big payoff is this playoff rainbow sitting at the end. And then to have it be over in a week, it's like, ah, oh, are you kidding me? And you I can't even imagine not making Capitals the playoffs. The, you, you just described my Washington Capitals for the past 15 years. I know. I shouldn't complain. Congratulations. We, we, the Kings made the cup and won it in the first year we had tickets. But it made me think, like, God, how do you keep season tickets in hockey for a team that sucks? Right. Great question. Hockey is a sport that should easily cut back by 12 games and figure yeah. out how to beef up the playoffs somehow. I, I'd go five and nine every round. Why not? Sure, sure, Just sure. Just do it. More playoff games, right. please. That's right. But in basketball, I like the system. They just have about six, seven too many games. We we really did, I feel like, kind of luck into um, a, a whole slew of almost perfect matchups. You know, the most interesting yeah. matchups possible in the first round have all, you know, arrived on, on our doorstep. I, you know, I was, and you know what else ahead. is great? What? The Knicks fans, as amazing as this sounds, are, are bitter right now and believing that they could have made the finals potentially if they just made the Kyle Lowry trade. <laughs> that can't possibly be true. That's true. I have talked to you, you have, more you than... You have a Knicks fan, friend, fan... Fan I, have, friend that I know two Knicks word. fans. I know two Nick fans who have explicitly said to me, "If we made the Lowry trade, we could have made the finals." Uh, that that's disgraceful. Well, think about it though. Ray Fountain was the worst point guard in the league. Kyle Lowry is probably the third best point guard in the league. He totally changes their team. Worst case scenario, they're an eight seed. They they pass Atlanta. They get to play this terrible Atlanta team in, or Indiana team in round one. Then they get your Wizards in round two. Then Miami in round three, who they, they always play well. Yeah, I, 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 it's a fun I, I alternate guess. universe, Joe House. I guess if you have to live there, if, if you're on the outside looking in and you need uh, 
you need something to keep you going during the playoffs when your team's out of it, then by, by all means, Kyle Lowry, there you go. All right, uh, let's talk Game of Thrones for two minutes, and then we'll hang up. Okay. Um, Game of Thrones. <laughs> it just feels like there's been an enormous amount of table setting. Yeah. I have really enjoyed the that 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 the series doesn't feel like in a rush this year mm. to get, you know, big plot lines fulfilled or even really give us any any hints. I mean, there's been some indication of the way <laughs> certain stuff is going to go down. You know, there's going to be a great big war with Khaleesi and her army. You know that John Stark uh and the and the and the wildings are going to, you know, there's something going to Go down there, but I I just have really r- reveled in relished um, the setup. I mean, the Lannisters have been been delicious. The notwithstanding the um, I'm going to call it. Uh, no, let's call it, gonna, let's call it the the borderline rape. It, well, I don't. Yeah, I mean, I was going to call it like mildly disturbing, but I, I I'm no, gonna, no, it was I'm disturbing. Gonna, it was disturbing. The disturbing end to last week's show. Sure. But so that that's kind of my my sense of it. What, what, how you've been feeling about it? Don't you think though, Game of Thrones, like they do that stuff because they're trying to put the entire show into basically the Tyson zone, where it's like we'll do anything on this show. Oh, you don't think we'll have the brother and sister have incest sex right next to their dead incest baby? Watch this. We're doing it. <laughs> we will cross every line that we can. We want you guys to be on the. Uh, on the edge of your seat at all times, not knowing what the hell is going to happen. Oh, you, you made, want us to cut so, off the unloved Joyce penis? Done. <laughs> Chopping it, it off. Made, Why'd they have to do that, me, by the way? Why'd they do that? Why'd they cut it off? I don't off? know. That one, poor Theon Lovejoy. I still don't understand the point of him. I don't know. Who, I mean, maybe it's because we're not reading the books. I've never read the books. I don't understand that plot line one bit. Why, why does he matter? I love when people get upset when something happens that's not in the book. <laughs> I mean, there's a whole internet outrage subplot this week about that the rape wasn't in the book. <laughs> that rape was out of line. It wasn't in the book. It's like, come on. Whoa. It's a TV right. show. Right. It's so a TV weird. show. Get a life. I don't understand that at all. What's um, the point of getting mad anyway? If you had Game of Thrones versus Mad Men, uh, as boxing rounds going head to head those last two weeks, I would have had Game of Thrones ten eight round one two weeks ago with the uh, yeah. Joffrey dying. That was a yeah. knockdown. Knockdown. Um, last week I, I would also give a ten nine round to Game of Thrones. Ten, yeah, ten eight two weeks ago, ten nine this week. So they're totally up. Totally agree. Okay, Jim, I got Game of Thrones off ten eight seventeen. <laughs> it's the Harold Letterman first session. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> I like that. But I think Mad I Men. Can't do Lampley. Mad Men. Uh, I think Mad Men comes up big this week. Okay, good. I'm ready. Do, are Mad you Men pro hasn't, or... hasn't done anything for me yet. You know the problem with Mad Men. I think it's just been on too long. The breaks are too long. I feel like we've been watching a show for like ten years. It does. It absolutely. That's a very valid. I just feel like. Uh, it, it, we, we, they should have moved into the 70s by now or something. I, can't, I, I have to confess, I kind of forgot that, that, that Don effectively got fired. You know, it's like, oh, right. That's why he's aimless and listless and searching and all these. And, I, and honestly, part of the reason why I haven't really loved Mad Men this year, I don't like my Don Draper this way. I don't either. I was really upset. First of all, unbelievable to see Nev Campbell. That was a stunner. Really enjoyed it. It made me feel tingly all over the place. Yeah, I'm not going to tell you. It brought back a lot of mid-90s tingles, I'll tell you that much. Sure. What a great, great cameo. But the fact that Don didn't seal the deal was really, really profoundly disappointing. Yeah, it may may or may not have sparked a minor fight in my household with my wife. It was like watching MJ walk past the blackjack table. Just like, come on. (laughs) Sit down and play some blackjack. We're all here. Just do it. Just do it. What do, you, what, we, what do you think we're here for? Stay on the brand, Don Draper. Jesus. Uh, and then uh, hey, that that made me sad. I don't like that he's unemployed. Um, hey, Roger, Roger with the whole swinging lifestyle in the apartment was kind of creeped me out. Yeah. 
I don't like mean racist Peggy. Me I don't like either. That they did Not that. even a little bit. I know. I don't, I don't like what's happening to Mad Men. Maybe it's deliberate, you know? Maybe. It's hard to complain about a free TV show that brought us so much joy. But <laughs> I just think with the, you know, the great thing about Breaking Bad, although I binge watched it, so I watched it all at once, but yeah. you could jump back in in the next season after the 10-month hiatus, and it really wasn't that hard to follow what was going on. But these these shows that are trapped in the minutia with Mad Men and Game of Thrones, where you have to, it's almost like you have to do homework to start watching the show again. There's 40 I, I, subplots going on in each show. It's like, I, I don't know. I watch these shows when it happens. I don't have time to, like, you know, freaking regroup and rethink everything that I saw and remember everything. Well, I wonder and, if, so here's the thing. I feel like Game of Thrones has recognized that predicament and and addressed it by sort of slowly walking us back into the, the plot lines and reintroducing everybody's characters and the motivations they had from the previous season and that, 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 which is why I feel like, you know, all this table setting stuff, um, you know, it's really sort of building the appropriate narrative tension for me. And it's why I, I, I'm, I'm pissed at Mad Men. I feel like I'm just lost. I don't, I don't know this. It's a different era and there are, all the characters are different and I don't like them. And I, I don't know what's going to have to happen to, to bring me back. <laughs> I'll be honest. If it wasn't for my Lambert's recaps, um, I wouldn't know 60% of what's going on with Mad Men because I zone out half the time because it's too friggin' slow. Yeah. Thanks, Molly Lambert. She Molly Lambert job. is like Molly Lambert is like the ET to the Elliot of that show or vice versa. Well, she it's translates like, it. She's, she's the muse. She Mad translates Man translator. it. She is. For some reason, that, that Matthew Weiner is writing that show specifically for her and she just understands the whole thing. It's true. Yeah. And, and uh, you know, Game of Thrones... The uh, Khaleesi and the Dragons. I think Khaleesi has the highest PER per scene of anyone in the history of acting. Yeah, sure. She's been in maybe, I'm going to say 25 scenes in the last 15 episodes, and she has a PR in the mid-30s. Because there, there, there are no throwaway moments with her. All she's doing right now is kicking ass. Relentless ass kicking by Khaleesi. <laughs> and Khaleesi is like... She, it's like when LeBron had that streak when he was shooting like 65% for, for two months or whatever. That's right. She just played, you check the, the Game of Thrones box score and it's always like, oh, Khaleesi. Um, yeah, she's eight for nine. She's yeah, 12 well, rebounds and 11 assists in 19 she's minutes. She's the MVP. What do you yeah. expect out of your MVP? She's the GOT Khaleesi. MVP. They could spin Khaleesi off tomorrow and I'd be in. All in. 100%. All right, Joe House. Good luck with the Wizards. Who are you taking tonight? Thank you. Great, big, big, big game tonight for D.C. D.C. rising. Who are you I taking? I got my bullets fever. We'll see how it goes. Who are you taking? Of course, the almost bullets, 100%. Man, no, who are, you taking, who are you taking in the game? Oh, uh, <laughs> so... Uh, I, I'm I'm laughing because I'm going to confess something that I'm positive will get me in trouble. So I'm definitely taking my wife. Oh, because uh, it's a ballsy overdue. call. I like it. Is she good luck? She she's definitely good luck. She was with me um, the last time the uh, almost bullets beat the Bulls. She was at that um, game six with me. She's definitely good luck. The other thing is, um, and this is the trouble part. Uh, if I take her tonight. I don't have to take her again. <laughs> so, You're begging you know. it out early. <laughs> yeah. Is she going to be offended when you have seven beers and start spitting all over the people in front of you because you're so upset at Randy Whitman or no? She knows. She's okay. used to it. She's seen it before. All right. Enjoy it. Say hi to Barry for me. Say hi to Michelle. Say hi to Nene and say hi to Gortat. Thank you for all the well wishes. Appreciate it. Thanks, Joe House. Talk to you later. I get the sound off. Whoa. Thank you for downloading the BS Report with Bill Simmons. Too much fun. Check out more podcasts at the iTunes Music Store or at PodCenter at ESPNRadio.com. Peace out. Hey, what you got there, Golic? The new Subway Chipotle chicken melt with guacamole. Man, that looks good. Yeah, this new guac is really bringing the flavor. Got one for me too, right? Well, yes and no. 
Uh, mostly no. Well, really, all no. Oy. Try the irresistible new Subway Chipotle Chicken Melt with guacamole, juicy grilled chicken strips with Monterey cheddar, Chipotle Southwest sauce, and new guacamole made from ripe Haas avocados with just a hint of jalapeno. Subway, eat fresh.